Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Palm Harvest Network. I'm Pastor Mike Decker. Say hello, Pastor Mike. <laughs> Super glad that you're tuning in. Today we are broadcasting from an out-of-the-way location here in Costa Mesa, California, known as Fairview Park. How many of you have been down here to Fairview Park? I would venture to say many of you probably haven't. But as you can see uh, from the footage that Beto is putting here on the screen ahead of you, Fairview is this beautiful park, really expansive, super quiet. And the reason I chose this location for today's conversation is because that the Bible story that we're gonna read together and unpack together involves a shepherd and his sheep. And so because this story, this Bible story, sort of have, has agricultural overtones, I thought it would be appropriate for us to meet here outdoors in this park grassy area. And so just to kind of bring you up to speed with where we've been over the last several weeks, uh, if you've been around uh, Palm Harvest, you know that we started just a few weeks ago a new sermon series that I'm calling RE. RE. And the goal in this series is to look at one word uh, in the Bible, a reword, if you will, and then sort of unpack it and try to apply it in our life. Well, today, the word that I want you to look for in this shepherd story is the word repent. Repent. And so, as we unpack this shepherd story, here's the big idea that I invite you to consider in our conversation, and that is this. Heaven rejoices when a sinner repents. Heaven rejoices when a sinner repents. Well, if you have a Bible uh, close by, whether it be in paper or digital form on one of your uh, apps, I invite you to turn to the, the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. You know, when Jesus walked here on this earth, one of the things that he was often criticized, as, as you might know, is for being uh, a friend of sinners, if you will, for fraternizing with those people, hanging out with what uh, the people of that day called religious outcasts. So, a show of hands, any, any sinners tuning in today? Yeah, yeah, me too. Well, listen, for those of you who are familiar uh, with the Bible, you know that the religious teachers of the day were, uh, were uh, sort of the religious preachers, if you will, might be considered like the, the spiritual Nazis. That's a harsh word. But they were the, the better, maybe a better word, is they were the spiritual police. And part of the, they saw their role uh, within the Jewish context as leaders who were to try to help their people, so to speak, the Jewish people, live a life that, that honored God. Um, but in their mind, what religious living meant was they would separate oneself from the world. And so when Jesus came on the, the scene and started fraternizing with the riffraff, you know, started hanging out with the, these notorious sinners, as we're going to read about here in today's story, the people uh, of the community who really uh, were outside the, 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 the halls, so to speak, uh, of the church, these Jewish religious leaders, these Pharisees, were very quick to criticize. Because in their thinking, in their theological worldview, if Jesus was really the Son of God who he claimed to be, then he wouldn't hang out with such vagrants. Rather, Jesus would spend more of his time in the synagogue. He would spend more of his time in the church. And so, in response to Jesus's or the Pharisees' criticism, in response to the Pharisees' criticism, Jesus tells a story. And his story involves a shepherd with 100 sheep. And so if you found Luke chapter 15, I'm going to start reading at verse 1. This is what we're told. It says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came, often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. Now stop here for a minute. I love this first Bible verse for, for a couple of reasons. 
You know, one reason is because it highlights the truth that even people outside the church are spiritually hungry. I mean, when you think about your social circles, think about your friends and your family, maybe even your coworkers, do you know anybody who is not a churchgoer? You know, one of the takeaways for me here in verse one is that just because a person doesn't feel comfortable necessarily in an organized religious setting doesn't mean that they're anti-God. You know, it doesn't mean that they are necessarily anti-spirituality. And maybe you would, you know, see yourself in that category. Well, anyways, go back to look at verse one again. So tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such evil people, or such sinful people, even eating with them. So then Jesus tells them this story. He said, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. Now I want you to put yourself for a moment in the sandals of this shepherd. You know, if, if you have 100 sheep that you are responsible for, if you have 100 sheep who are in your care, while counting them, you suddenly realize that one of them is missing, right? You suddenly realize that one of them has wandered away from the flock. What are your choices? Well, one choice, obviously, is to do nothing. You know, you can say, well, I have 99 other sheep, right? C'est la vie, little lamb. I, sorry that you're on your own, you know, such is life. I hope the wolves don't get you. That is one choice you as a shepherd could make. Or you could do what the shepherd in this particular story does. You could choose to go out. You could search for that lost sheep to try to find and rescue him which, as I have just mentioned, is the choice that the shepherd in Jesus' story does. But then notice how Jesus brings home his point of his story to these Pharisees who are criticizing him. Look at verse 7 here uh, in, in, in the scripture text. Jesus says, in the same way, in the same way that the shepherd finds this lost sheep, in the same way there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents, there's our word, repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Now church, there are three points that I want you to consider as we reflect on this Bible story that Jesus tells us. The first point is this. Heaven values every soul. Heaven values every soul. A show of hands, how many of you have ever flown on an airplane? Yeah, most of us. You know, in aeronautical terminology, in the airplane travel world, when counting the number of passengers, uh, the number of living people on board an aircraft vessel, air traffic controllers and pilots will uh, refer to their passengers, to their living cargo as SOBs, but maybe not in the sense that you're, you might be thinking right now. SOBs stands for souls, souls on board. So let's take it, let's do a math riddle here. If you have 200 passengers along with the flight crew of, say, let's 11, 11 and the flight crew, which uh, includes your pilots, how many SOBs, how many souls on board would your manifest record? 200 plus 11 equals what? 211. 211 SOBs, 211 souls on board. Well, for some reason, while you're flying from destination A to, to destination B, and one of those passengers, those living passengers dies, now how many SOBs do you have on board? 
Well, 211 minus 1 equals what? 210 SOBs. Here's my point. Every living person is counted. Every living person matters. You know, one of the truths that Jesus is reinforcing to his Pharisee criticizers is the truth that heaven values every soul, both the sheep in the pen and the sheep outside of the pen. Now, in this story, Jesus is not literally talking about, you know, a fluffy creature that goes bah when, when it opens its mouth, right? Rather, the sheep in Jesus' story is who? The sheep in Jesus' story are people. The sheep are these tax collectors and notorious sinners whom Jesus is hanging and out with. The, che- the sheep are living souls. The sheep are you. The sheep are me. And when Jesus tells this story, he is making the point that heaven values every soul. And heaven especially values those, those souls that are outside the sheep pen. So I want you to personalize the point, this first point here in this story, and say this phrase to yourself. Say, God values me. God values me. Friend, Jesus' Bible story reinforces the simple truth that God values sinners, that heaven values every soul, that God values you, that God values me. God values me. Point number two. A second truth that Jesus is making here in his sheep story is the truth that heaven pursues every soul. Heaven pursues every soul, particularly the lost soul. If you were to read on in the Gospel of Luke and just go forward three chapters, you would read a story of another dinner party that Jesus is at. This time he's eating at the home of a guy by the name of Zacchaeus, who the Bible tells us is the chief tax collector in that uh, region. Um, If you know anything about tax collectors, you know that they were not liked, they were not popular, largely because they got rich by overtaxing people. And because Zacchaeus is the chief tax collector, we can make the the assumption that Zacchaeus is, you know, extremely despised by the people. And that is certainly true by by the Pharisees. And so not surprisingly, these religious elite were not happy about the fact and Jesus' choice to break bread with Zac. But like this story previous, three chapters previously, where Jesus tells us this story of the shepherd who goes out looking for his lost sheep. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus responds with a statement that really defines his, his perspective and his kingdom mission. Jesus responds to the Pharisees' criticism with this, this statement. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. The Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Translation, heaven pursues every soul. Friend, I don't know what your life story is. I don't know if you're inside the sheep pen or or outside the sheep pen. But what I do know And what I've come to experience in my own life and what I invite you to consider believing for yourself is that heaven is pursuing you. Heaven is pursuing me. The good shepherd, we're told, seeks high and low to seek and to save his lost sheep. 
And so if you're, if you're with somebody right now, maybe you're sitting on the couch watching this broadcast or even listening to it in your car while you're driving, would you turn to your neighbor and say, God is pursuing you? God is pursuing you. Friend, God is passionately pursuing you. You know, going back to our sheep story in, in Luke chapter 15, I'm fascinated by the response of the shepherd after he locates his sheep, after he and his sheep are reunited. You know, notice particularly what the shepherd doesn't do. We see here that the shepherd doesn't beat his sheep with his, you know, his shepherd staff. He doesn't go, bad sheep, bad sheep, whack, 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 right? There's no mention of violence necessarily in, in this sheep story. You know, he doesn't hog tie its legs so it can't run away again, nor does he put a collar around its neck with maybe a really long leash on it attached to it to keep his sheep from wandering off. But rather, what are we told that the shepherd does? We're told here that the shepherd picks up, lovingly picks up his sheep, places it on his shoulders, and then Jesus describes how when the shepherd gets back to the sheep pen, he calls together all of his friends to celebrate the finding of his lost sheep. Basically, what we see here described is how the shepherd throws a party. Reinforcing point number three, that heaven celebrates every repentant soul. Heaven celebrates every repentant soul. Jesus said in verse seven, look at it. He says, there's more joy. There's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Friends, are you kidding me? How cool is that? So let's close our conversation in, in two ways. First, if you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus, I, I want to encourage you to do so because this Bible story reinforces this powerful truth that heaven values you and that heaven is, is pursuing you. We're told here and described how the Good Shepherd loves you. You know, God has a soft spot in his heart for vagrants like me, made for vagrants like you. Let Jesus carry you. Give your heart to Jesus and invite him to be your Good Shepherd. And then the second option that I would encourage those of you who maybe call yourself a Christian, for those of you who have already given your heart to Jesus and invited him and asked him to be your good shepherd, think about this. I think it's easy and maybe even a, maybe even a little bit natural when we read this Bible story that Jesus tells about these hundred sheep I think it's easy and even natural for us to consider ourselves, those of us who are Christians, as one of the 99, right? Is that where you put yourself in this sheep camp? Are you one of the good sheep? Certainly that's how the Pharisees viewed themselves. But truth be told, if we're not careful, you and I can start acting and thinking like the Pharisees, right? By being judgmental, by being self-righteous, by adopting this, I'm better than you attitude. Church, don't be a Pharisee. In fact, turn to your neighbor right now and say, don't be a Pharisee. Listen, if heaven rejoices when a sinner repents, if you're a Christ follower, where in your life might you consider repenting of? So let me offer a couple of suggestions for you to self-evaluate. Let's start with what the Pharisees struggled with. You know, are you guilty of being self-righteous? Are you guilty of seeing yourself as better than others? Are you quick to judge? 
Do you find yourself being critical of what other people do or how they live? If so, I encourage you to repent of this behavior. Don't be a Pharisee. You know, in the news right now, locally here in Los Angeles, Alec Baldwin was recently in this uh, mishap involving a, a, a gun, a loaded gun on the movie set. And if you know anything about Alec Baldwin, particularly out here in, in Southern California, you know that he is not a fan of, of handguns. And so he's come out and he's done a lot of spewing about um, the, 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 the need to, to lock down gun violence, and, and rightly so, but handgun ownership. And, and, and so some of us who are handgun owners, and maybe you find yourself in this camp, it's easy for us to now throw rocks at, at Alec and go, oh, good, way to go, buddy. Uh, and, and we want to see him you know, thrown in jail and, 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 and throw the key away. And maybe that's what he deserves. But friends, don't celebrate. If you find yourself celebrating other people's losses or other people's tragedy, be careful. Be careful because isn't that what the Pharisees are doing here in the story? Or how about being competitive. You know, when you look at your own life and you, you know, kind of evaluate your own wiring, are you someone, would you describe yourself as being competitive? So if you are, think about this. Are you someone who cheers on people? You know, do you celebrate when other people win and experience success in their life? Or do you enjoy seeing your competitors fail? You know, do you feel pleasure when your enemies struggle? I'm suggesting, brothers and sisters, that competitiveness might be a sin that some of us need to repent of. Or I wonder if any of you are guilty of individualism. Individualism. You know, that's the attitude that of I can handle this on my own, right? We say, I don't need anyone's help. I don't need to be a part of the flock. Yes, friend, you do. You need the flock. I need the flock. And so maybe God is nudging you today to consider repenting of this spirit of individualism. Or how about forgiving others? Whew, that's a tough one. Are you holding a grudge against anyone? Well, you say, Mike, you, you have no idea what this person has done to me. Mike, you have no idea how much, how they have betrayed me or how they have hurt me. True, absolutely true. I do not, but it doesn't mean that you have to hold that pain in your heart. It doesn't mean that you have to not forgive. You know, Jesus reminds us here in this Bible story that heaven rejoices when a sinner repents. Why? Because repentance produces freedom. Repentance leads to health. Confession of sin, and I have learned this personally in my own life, and it's what Jesus is really reinforcing here. Confession of sin restores the one who is fractured. Church, even the 99 have things to repent of. Unless you're driving in a car right now, I want to invite you to close your eyes. Take a deep breath, inhale, hold it for a moment, and exhale. One more time. Another deep breath. And as you're exhaling, I want you to review in your mind what we discussed today. You know, simmer on this truth that God values you that God is pursuing you, that he celebrates when we return to him. 
so in this moment, let's return to him, shall we? Would you pray this in your heart? God, would you forgive me? God, would you please help me? God, would you please carry me? And then pray this prayer. Say, God, thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you, God, for for being my shepherd who pursues me. And thank you, God, for helping me do better this week with loving others. Amen. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining me today for this conversation. If you have a prayer request, I just want to encourage you to you know, download the Palm Harvest app and use that to uh, you know, get in touch with me. Just this couple, two days ago, for example, someone reached out to me who had been listening to our weekly meditation moment and uh, a young woman who's facing breast cancer surgery coming up in November. And so it was just a joy for, for me to interact with her then after her you know, reaching out and to bring in my prayer team here at Palm Harvest. And so if you have something going on in your life, would you just let me know? Uh, use your prayer app, that prayer response app, uh, card so to speak in the app and uh, we can we can uh, join each other on this journey and then lastly I would just say if you want to uh, you can even even use the app to to give and help support our ministry financially and so if you like these broadcasts and they're helpful to you and you want to see uh, them more of them in the future love for you to to share uh, share the wealth <laughs> so to speak and join us in on this this broadcast journey Listen, thanks again uh, for for tuning in. I'm Pastor Mike Decker saying uh, so long from Fairview Park here in Costa Mesa. God bless you, and I'll see you next week.